Hello everyone. Welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Israel. This is Parashat Re'eh. Look. Deuteronomy 11.26 to 16.17. This one was called the gates of heaven. Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing that you will heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I commanded you today. And the curse, if you will not heed the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn away from the way I command you this day to follow other gods, which you did not know. We're just going to jump right into it because there's a lot. So last year we discussed the difference between ani and anochi, right? It starts off in Hebrew, re'e anochi. You can watch last year's teaching and you even got a funny little poem in there, right? So ani is I and anochi is I myself personally. It's a different way of saying it. It's more personal. While I, Ani, is a more general term, right? Okay, as we can see from texts such as Ani Hashem Eloichem, Asher Hotzeti Etchem Eretz Mitzrayim, poorly translated as I am the Lord your God who has taken you out of the land of Egypt. I'll explain. The word Elohim, right? Or Elohim, again, is, it's plural for gods, right? The word Eloha is singular. So why does the Torah speak of God in a plural tense? The nations who are but a bit versed with the Hebrew will see this as a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all being equal. But that's why those are foreign religions and foreign gods. But again, we don't need to tell them that they're wrong. Let them believe what they want, because they will. To us, however, who have a deeper understanding of what this plurality actually means because we were actually given not only the understanding of how to properly expound of this concept, on this concept, and the concepts of the Torah, but we have been given the actual codes. The plurality of Elohim are the attributes of God, as we discussed, the chesed, the gvura, tiferet, netzachod, yesod, malchut, and so on and so forth. Better known as the sfirot, as we've gone over so many times. As we know, God created the world through what? Judgment. Judge Elohim is judgment. But then balance that judgment with mercy. And we also know that the, the four-letter name of God, the yud ke vav ke, is mercy. Okay, so we get this. Let's go back to one of the most repetitive verses in the Torah. Ani Hashem Eloichem asher tzeti etchem eretz Mitzrayim, right? Liot lachem leElohim. I am the Lord your God who has taken you out of the land of Egypt. If it was in the single tense, it would have said, Elohachem, Eloha. Ani Hashem Elohachem, not Eloheichem. Eloheichem is plural. So, how can we attribute this? I believe this was already discussed before, that God took out Israel with his mighty right hand, which is mercy. Yeah, we did discuss this before, right? So wait, but he smote the Egyptians. How could it be with the right hand? The right hand is mercy. While by default, destruction comes from the left hand, which is judgment. So is mercy with inside judgment to the right hand for Israel and the left hand of judgment for Egypt. Meaning there are multiple aspects of God always acting within every action. In fact, within the Sefirot themselves, each Sefirah, each attribute, contains all the other ten attributes. And then it's just mixing and matching according to the codes that were given. Now this is part of the deeper study of Kabbalah, which gives us a multi-dimensional depiction of our Creator, as opposed to the nations who say he's a dude and will call it good. All right, it's simple. There are no two ways about it. So, behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. How else do we know that this is a personal account of Moses? Because this is what's happening, right? The book of Deuteronomy is Moses speaking to the people. The very first of the Ten Commandments, just so there is no confusion here, was the first of the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord your God who took you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage, okay, which is different than Ani, because here he says, Anochi Hashem Elohecha, Asher 
מארץ מצרים, מבית עבדים. אנוכי, I myself alone personally with no one's help. השם, י"ק ו"ק, mercy, this name is reserved only for my children Israel. אלוהיך, multiple attributes which the nations will not understand. Who took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage? Remember the format of the Shema that we discussed a couple weeks ago? Go check that out. You'll see these pieces of the puzzle coming together very nicely. So when Moses says, anochi, Look at me, as we discussed last year, he's trying to grab Israel's attention. Hey, hey, look at me. Look at me. No, no, no. Look at, no, look at me. Let everyone else read what they want, whatever. Most people never even focus on this stuff. I mean, as you know, because it's in Hebrew, A, and B, because they don't even know what to look for. I find it hilarious, though, that really all the nations have to say about these verses is the blessings and the curses, and you should choose the blessings. You think? That is profound. Where do you get that stuff from? But what the nations don't seem to realize and will never understand is that they're all connected. The blessings, meaning the blessings and the curses. The blessings come with the curses and the curses come with the blessings. In fact, they are both sides of the same coin, if you will. They both come from the same source, just as good and bad comes from the same source, right? God creates light and dark, good, bad, and so on and so forth, and so forth, including the blessings and the curses. Those are bad, yeah, but they serve a purpose and you can make them actually good. Anyway, but we understand that it's not about the curses, but rather about the challenges to overcome in this regard. And it's also not about the blessings either, but rather the motivation to which you serve God. Don't you see? They're both equal. My friends, just so we are clear, serving God is the blessing and not serving Him is the curse. If you're gaining new perspective, let's read on. Verse 27, the blessing. What is the blessing, right? What are they? That you will heed the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today. That's the blessing. It's very simple. This is what we're discussing. And the curse. What's the curse? What are the curses? If you will, I'm just reading the verse, if you will not heed the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn away from the way that I command you this day, how will we turn away through what means to follow other gods which you did not know? We're going to discuss that at the end of the teaching, bring it right back. Now, do you see how simple it is? But no one wants to break this down, right? Because you got the five books of Moses. Uh, four out of the five are basically giving you commands. Most of these commands are tossed aside or people pick and choose. Well, okay, we'll do this one, but not that one. I don't think I need to do... You do. It's everything. It's all or nothing. But do you see how simple this is? If you have the right frame of mind, you can actually read the text almost even in English and gain such a better understanding if you're not coming with an agenda. I'm just trying to teach you here. If you do not follow God's commandments, meaning the Torah, obviously there's no question here anymore. You follow other gods by default. By default. If you say, I do this, but I don't do that, because that is not following God. That means you are by default following other gods. Because you can't serve part of God, right? Because there are other gods out there. There are other entities who have godly powers, if you will. And then this is how the confusion begins. <sighs> but I think it's absolutely fascinating that this about serving other gods is what stands out over here in these opening verses. Now that we have gained just even a bit more perspective, we're going to go into something that would seem so painfully obvious but it's not, and yet it is. First of all, if you have not read the Parsha, I would strongly suggest you pause the video right here, take 15 minutes to read it, 
and then come back to me. It's okay if you do this. I'll def it'll definitely enrich your learning experience and you will gain understanding. So please, for your own sakes, do this. Now, if you're driving or walking and I'm in your ear, so just pay attention, okay? Then that means you're gonna have to take my word for it that this is what it says in the Parsha. What is the one line, if you have read the Parsha and just come back to us and welcome back, What's the one line of the Parsha that repeats itself, not verse, but line within the verses that repeats itself 13 times in the Parsha? To, play, to the place which the Lord your God shall choose. It just smacks you in the face like, okay, 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 13 times. El hamakom asher ivchar Hashem Eloichem. If this is not driving you crazy after reading this, then sit tight because I'm going to do my best to drive you crazy, to get under your skin for learning purposes, of course. It's not like I enjoy it or anything. Chapter 12, verse 5, but only to the place which the Lord your God shall choose from all your tribes to set his name there. You shall inquire after his dwelling and come there. Verse 11, and it will be that the place the Lord your God will choose in which to establish his name there, you shall bring all that I am commanding you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the separation by your hand, and the choice of vows which you will vow to the Lord. Verse 14, but only in the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There you shall offer up your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you to do. Oh, we're not done. Verse 21. In the place of the place the Lord your God chooses to put his name will be distant from you. You may slaughter your cattle of your sheep, which the Lord has given you. Don't forget who gave you your cattle and your sheep. And as I have commanded you, and you may eat in your cities according to every desire of your soul. Whew, that's a lot. Verse 26. However, your holy offerings, which you will have, and your vows, you shall carry and come, say it with me, to the place that the Lord chooses. Well, that's it for chapter, uh, that one. No, we're not done. Chapter 14, verse 23. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place he chooses to establish his name therein. The tithes of your grain, your wine and your oil and the firstborn of your cattle and of your sheep so that you may learn, learn to fear the Lord your God all the days. Verse 24. And if the way be too long for you, that you are unable to carry it for the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name therein is too far for you for the Lord your God will bless you. Verse 25, then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand and you shall go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Chapter 16. I'm doing this on purpose, by the way. Okay, I'm just, yeah. Read it with me. Chapter 16, verse 2. You shall slaughter the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God of the flock and the festival sacrifices of the cattle in the place which the Lord will choose to establish his name therein. Whew. Verse 6. Except at the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name there, you shall slaughter the Passover offering in the afternoon as the sun sets at the appointed time that you went out of Egypt. Hmm, are we done? No, we're not done. Verse 11, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter and your manservant and your maidservant and the Levite who is within your cities and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are mourning you. Okay, great. We are rejoicing. Where are we rejoicing? Where are we rejoicing? In the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name therein. Verse 15, we're not done. Seven days you shall celebrate the festival to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce. Where, what, where? And in all the work of your hands, you will only be happy. Verse 16, three times a year, every one of your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place he will choose on the festival of Matzah and the festival of weeks and the festival of Sukkot, and he shall not appear before the Lord empty handed what place is Moses referring to that God is talking about? Huh? 
What place did God establish his name? We all know this. Shame on you if you don't. This is Jerusalem, obviously. Okay, so we know this. So what's so annoying or frustrating about this, other than the fact that it's literally said 13 times in the Parsha? Hmm? It's that the children of Israel who are being told all these do's and don'ts and the goodses and the badses and the sacrifice and rejoice and don't you dare not and you better come here and so on and so forth. Blessings and curses and laws and commands and statues. Statutes have no idea what is this magical, mystical, special place that the Lord our God will choose to establish his name therein. They're hearing all this and they're like, "Uh uh-huh. Which is why, out of solidarity with our brethren, and for the sake of learning, of course, we're going to read these verses again. Only this time, we don't know it's in Jerusalem. Okay. You need to get there so you can see it. I'm doing this on purpose. Stay. I'm considering while I'm reading this right now, I was like, that's a lot. Are we going to do it again? Yes, we're going to do it again. Again, in your mind, you have no idea that it's Jerusalem. You do not know. You are standing right there about to enter the promised land. And the greatest prophet who have ever lived is telling you the following. You need to unlearn what you have learned so you can understand what is being done. I ain't only talking about here. I'm talking about everything that you think that you learned. You need to reboot your system because there is a breakdown in communication. Are you ready? Remember, you know nothing, only what you are told. Okay, let's take a breath. Here we go. Chapter 12, verse 5. But only to the place which the Lord your God shall choose from all your tribes to set his name there. 11. That the place the Lord your God will choose in which to establish his name there. 14. But only in the place the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, there you shall offer up your offerings. 21. If the Lord, if the the place that the Lord your God chooses to put his name therein will be distant from you, you may slaughter your cattle and your sheep, which the Lord has given you, and as I have commanded you, and you may eat in your cities according to every desire of your soul. 26. However, your holy offerings, which you will have and vows, you shall carry and come to the place that the Lord chooses. Chapter 14, verse 23. You don't know where this place is. You have no idea. Okay. All right. Okay. And you should, we're, we're the children of Israel. We're listening. We're listening to Moshe. This is important. Don't look at me like that. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place he chooses to establish his name therein. I'm still shortening for you anyway. Verse 24. And in the way, if the way is too long for you that you are unable to carry it for the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name therein is too far from you for the Lord your God will bless you. Verse 25. Then you shall turn it into money and bind up the money in your hand. And you shall go to the place that the Lord your God will choose. Chapter 16, verse 2. Okay. Uh, the sacrifices in the place the Lord your God will choose to establish his name therein. Verse 6, except at the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name there, you shall slaughter the Passover offering. What place? 11, who are among you? Okay, in the orphan, this is the rejoicing in the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name therein. 15, seven days you shall celebrate the festival of the Lord your God in the place that the Lord your God shall choose because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce. Where is this place so I can be blessed? 16, three times a year, every one of your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place he will choose on the festival of Matzah, that's Pesach, on the festival of weeks, that is literally Shavuot, and on the festival of Sukkot, we know that. And he shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Yo, Moshe, if you say in the place which the Lord God chooses one more time, oh, we're going to lose it. How are we supposed to know where to go? How are we supposed to know what to do? Who could... How could anyone possibly live like this and go, you know, in some general direction until God says stop and, oh, I see what you're doing. And the Lord said to Abraham, go forth from your land and from your birthplace and from your father's house to the land that I'll show you. Huh? Sorry, Moshe. 
proceed. We're, we're, take, we're taking notes. Yeah, but here's the thing, kids. You can't take notes on this one. You need to listen. You need to obey. You need to pay attention. And then you will see it. And when you do see it, don't share it. This can only be discussed among those who see it as well. For two reasons. One. Those who don't see it will not understand, and they will get angry that you supposedly see something. And two, those that don't see it are not supposed to see it. Therefore, those who see it, see it, and those who do not, will not by design. How many times is Jerusalem mentioned in the five books of Moses? The correct answer is zero. It's referenced a whole bunch Sure, but the word Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, is not mentioned. And this too is by design. It's mentioned about 800 times in the Nevim and Tuvim, Yerushalayim, Yerushalam, Zion. Sometimes with the Yud, sometimes without the Yud. Nevertheless, it's very clear where we are speaking of. But why is it never mentioned clearly in the five books in the Torah? Now, since it all began with Abraham, the go in the general direction, and I'll tell you where to stop. Okay. Let's continue with Abraham, shall we? Now, you're probably thinking right now, wait a minute, but there was Melchizedek, right? In Bereshit, he was the king of Shalem, right? Sure, he was indeed the king of the area called Shalem, the area known as Jerusalem. But what does it say? Genesis 14, 18, and Melchizedek, the king of Shalem, brought out bread and wine, and he was a priest to the Most High God. Okay, so as discussed, so in other words, it doesn't say Yerushalem, or Yerushalem just says Shalem. Okay, so that doesn't count, and we know it doesn't count, because I also know this is written here. As discussed back when we learned this, Melchizedek is actually Shem, the son of of Noah, okay? Who knew Abraham because Abraham was raised in his house for years. They had a famous yeshiva, Yeshivat Shem, and his son Evel, Yeshivat Shem Evel. Abraham learned there, Yitzchak learned there, and Yaakov learned there. Famous yeshiva over there. All right. So that was Shem, the son of Noah. Um, and again, he and his father, Noah, were uh, Abraham's teachers. Okay, so we have the name Shalem. What does the name Shalem mean? Uh, mean it means whole, complete, or perfect. It's kind of also Shalom. Hey, what's up? Goodbye, right? Hello, goodbye, peace, all that stuff. But Shalem means whole, complete, or perfect. And then the other time that it's uh, that it was very clear as to where they are during, uh, uh, excuse me, that where they were was during the binding of Isaac, right? Genesis 22. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and Abraham said, and he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am, right? So we know this is the binding of Isaac. Now look how he tells him to go. The same way where he told him to go to the land of Canaan, right? Verse 2, and he said, Please take your son, your only son, whom you love, yea, Isaac, and go away, where? To the land of Moriah. Moriah was a, was a big area. And bring him up there for a burnt offering, where? On one of the mountains, which I will tell you. Sounds kind of like on the place which the Lord shall choose, right? Yeah. So we have a great hint over here. As we well know, that Temple Mount in, indeed is on Mount Moriah, in that direction. But it's very, uh, it's a very specific mountain within the land, and they're headed towards the mountain. On one of the mountains which I will tell you, or show you. This just continues from the earlier to the land that I will show you. Go to the land that I will show you. Go to the mountain which I will show you. Go to the place which the Lord God will let you know what's up. Okay, so one of the most significant events in the history of the world just took place. The trial that Abraham passes with flying colors, no less. And in verse 14, And Abraham named that place the Lord will see. As it is said to this day on the mountain, the Lord will be seen. 
Now, again, this is why Hebrew, because where do you get the name Jerusalem from? Here's where you get it from. Vaikra Avraham Shem Hamakom. Shem is the name. Hamakom, the place. Hahu, that one. Hashem Yire. God will see. Asher Yoamer Hayom, that it will be said. Hayom Bahar on that mountain. Hashem Yire. God will be seen. So when you combine Yira'e and Shalem, literally translates to wholeness, completion, or perfection will be seen. You get Yerushalem or Yerushalayim with the Yud. You see this? This is how you get this together. So now, Abraham knew the spot. He knows the spot. Isaac definitely knows the spot, okay? He was... He was on that spot. Does Jacob know the spot? Yeah, of course Jacob knows the spot. Genesis 28:11, And he hit the spot. We discussed this already uh, there because the sun had set. And he took some of the stones of the place and placed them at his head. And he lay down in that place. Stones of what place? The altar which Abraham built to sacrifice Isaac. And then remember, he wakes up in the morning. And the, the and by the way, there were 12 stones representing the the. 12 tribes, he wakes up in the morning and there was one single stone uniting the clans. So we learned this in Parashat Vayetze, stairway to heaven, highway to hell is what it was called. Check it out. So our patriarchs knew of this place, but this place still is not the city of, but rather a hilltop and not even necessarily the entire hilltop, but rather a 10 by 10 amot of space, which is uh, five by five meters or 16 by 16 feet, right? Which is that's Kodesh Kodashim, the Holy of Holies. It just so happens to be that on that very same spot, from the dust of that earth, Adam was, was created. So this is a very holy spot, surrounded by a very holy city, which mirrors something from above, as we know. If you've been reading the book of the temple, okay, this is up there. That's why we need it down here, too. It's like those building blocks for two-year-old children where you got to put them right through the slot. That's what has to happen, otherwise you can't. Okay. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had an idea of this since the three of them had made almost a complete rectification for Adam. Forgive me, though, I don't even recall which parsha we discussed this, but again, it was Abraham, and then it was Isaac, and then it was Jacob. They did Mamasha Tikkun for Adam Arishon. That's why they became the Merkava of God. Um, so as we know, Abraham was the first. He was God's chosen person of which he would give his name to out of all the inhabitants of the earth. And we've already discussed how Abraham's name appears in Genesis 2 hundreds of times at this point, who served as mercy to God's judgment in creating the world to suit Abraham. This is in 2... Th 2, 2 or something like that. It's the first time where you actually see... Hashem Elohim in the same verse. In other words, here comes mercy, and then you said Behi Bala'am. So we discussed it plenty, plenty of times. So if anything out of the ordinary would ever happen to Abraham, in other words, any kind of inconveniences, be it a mosquito or whatever, meaning if there ever seems, uh, the things don't seem to quite flow, then he knew that something was up, because Abraham lived a life of such perfection that when you are a complete tzaddik, things don't... There's even a thing in the Talmud. It's if you... Let's say you have your keys in your pocket, right? And there's a set of keys. And you reach your hand into your pocket. And you take out the key that you are actually looking for. It's a good thing, right? But if you don't, if you take out the wrong key, it's called um, it's called like a pidyon kaparot. In other words... It's, a, it's considered a punishment or even the slightest little inconvenience, okay? But it's, it's a whole thing with way not for this class. Anyway, so within Abraham's life, God told him exactly what, he's, what he needs to do. He passed those things with flying colors. He lived like Abraham, Avinu. And then because of that, everything went smoothly for him. Really, even that which seemed not smooth was smooth. So something was a little bit, what's going on here? He knew something was up. So what is so significant? Where, what's so, where is Abraham today? He's in Marat HaMachpelah, it's in Hebron, right? 
And what's so significant about that place? Now, if you're not familiar, I'm jumping there, okay? But it's not really that far of a jump, you'll see. What is the Marat HaMachpelah, the cave of the Machpelah, right? In Hebron. So if you are not familiar, it is the burial place of Abraham and Sarah, of Yitzchak and Rivka, of Yaakov and Leah, as well as the head of Esav. Now, another story, another time, the head of Esav. So we can understand based on the individuals buried there that this place is of tremendous value. But furthermore, why did Abraham specifically insist on purchasing this field, the place called the field of Machpelah, where there was a cave inside, on this specific plot of land, particularly this cave? Remember how we discussed that nothing happens by accident, no inconveniences, not when it comes to our forefathers or any kind of tzaddikim, right? Even Joseph, when he was inconvenienced with another two years in prison, was because he put his faith in man instead of put his faith in God. Learn from that, kids. If you put your faith in man, that's a no-no. So, when Abraham saw the three angels approaching, Michael, Gabriel, and Raphael, as he ran to bring them into his tent, right? We discussed this back in Genesis 18. The verse I am speaking of specifically is verse number 7, when it said that Abraham ran to get a bull and feed them. Verse goes like this, And to the cattle did Abraham run, and he took a calf, tender and good, and he gave it to the youth, and he hastened to prepare. The youth in this case was uh, um, Ishmael. Okay. Ve'el habakar ratz Avraham vaikach ben bakar. This is very, very strange. Ve'el habakar ratz Avraham. It could have said vaikach ben bakar rach v'tov. This whole el habakar ratz Avraham is, and he ran, and Abraham ran to the cattle. is very strange. So, what does it mean, right? It's a fascinating midrash, which can be found in Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer. When Abraham was coming to take a bull for the sake of literally and physically serving heavenly hosts, right? He did. When did he do this? After he circumcised himself. Three days later, once you are circumcised, now you are in covenant, blood covenant with God. Now you are worthy of hosting the archangels in your home, which is what happened. So now he's going to serve them and the bull ran away. This does not happen. This should not happen. This is something, <clears throat> this is very, very strange. Nothing happens for no reason, especially not in such spiritual, spiritually fused situations, especially not with these spiritual titans. So what happened? He chased the bull. Yeah, this is a bull. Get back here, bull. I'm going to kill you now. And then all of a sudden the bull runs into this cave. When Abraham ran after it and he entered the cave, what, or rather, who did he find? It said he found Adam and Eve laying down and sleeping. Okay, so this is what it says. It says that they were laying down and sleeping. Now, were they dead? Probably, as we may understand, sure, but don't forget. Okay, first of all, when we sleep, every time you go to sleep, you experience 1 60th of death. That's what that is. It's one sixtieth of death. But remember, Adam and Eve were no normal people. Adam and Eve were uh, not born. They were created. They became mortal. They became flesh and bone. Okay? Adam and Eve were the only people to have ever been in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, while they were still alive. Right now, only the good guys go to Gan Eden, but it's a spiritual place, right? They were beings of light, and God gave them skin when they became mortal, so they can survive in this physical world. Otherwise, where are you, you going to inhabit all these things? They are of a different makeup from anyone else who has ever, ever lived. Now, as Abraham approached them, there were candles above them that lit up the room, and there was such a pleasant smell in the air, which is why Abraham coveted the place. He goes, okay. Sums up here. He knew. He knew who he was. He knew who they were. And he had a very strong idea of where he was standing. So that's the story. And as we know, although he just found the burial site of the first man and woman ever, he grabbed the bull, ran back to his guests to serve them because 
priorities. And now we know that not only are the patriarchs, but three out of the four matriarchs buried there, as well as the head of Esau, but so are Adam and Eve. That's right. In Hebron, today, right there. So what's the deal with this cave? Why is this place so sacred to the Jews, second only to Temple Mount? Well, the truth is, if the nations really understood, if they actually had any idea. You know what it says around the uh, the gravesite of Jacob? Because again, the tombs are way, way higher than what it is. The, 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 the original tomb, sorry, the structures of the tombs, the tombs themselves are deep underground. But you're going to go to a place, you're going to walk up steps, and it's a whole building, and then there's tombs, but then there's cages around the tombs. You're not actually right by the grave sites. You're way, way above it. You know what it says over there by Jacob's grave? It's hanging by the tomb as taken from the Zohar. It says, Im bnei haolam hayu yodim ikrat kvodo, ikrat kvodo shel Yaakov avinu hayu melachikim et ha'afar b'shalosh parsaot ha'korovot lekivor. If the nations of the world, bnei haolam, the sons of the world, right? would know the value of the honor of Jacob, our father. They would be licking, licking the dust within three feet around his grave. It is also said of Abraham, by his gravesite, he had an even tova, a good stone around his neck, that everyone who would look upon Abraham would instantly be healed. Abraham did not even need to know that you existed. You could see him from a distance and boom, poof, you are healed. Let me tell you the deal. The Zohar states that Adam carved out this cave as a burial place for Eve and himself. Eve passed before Adam. And why was this spot so significant? Because Adam saw in this cave a thin light that ascended from the very spot which came out of the Garden of Eden. See, today we could be staring at the Garden of Eden and we wouldn't even know. But Adam was actually there. And so Marat HaMachpelah is indeed the terrestrial entrance to the spiritual Garden of Eden. Oh, snap. In fact, it's called Sha'ar Gan Eden, the gate of heaven. In the New Zohar, Rabbi Kasma said, indeed, it is adjacent to opening to the opening of Gan Eden. When Chava, Eve, died, Adam came to bury her there, and he could smell the smell of the Garden of Eden, which he was familiar with. Now, just a side note, are we familiar with the story of uh, Jacob wearing Asaph's clothing to secure his birthright? Right? We, we know this, right? But if not, I'll give you a recap because we studied this one as well. The only thing is, technically, they were not Asaph's clothing. If you actually read, it says Rivka took Esau's clothing and she put um, goat hair on his arms that he should be very hairy because Esau was very hairy, like a goat. Anyway, as we mentioned before, in that teaching, I got to look up, which is probably around that part or whichever one that was, uh, Vayetza maybe? Uh, the garments of skin that God made, no, not Vayetza, the one before Vayetza. Anyway, the garments of skin that God made for Adam and Eve. That's what these garments were. Upon Adam and Eve's death, they were passed to who? These garments, they were passed to Enoch, right? Enoch was still alive then, obviously. Um, who then, because Adam lived to 930 years old. Uh, so he gave them to Enoch. Enoch, who then became Metatron, the angel Metatron, he gave them to Metushelach, to Methuselah, who gave them to Noach, who were stolen by Ham, who gave them to his son Cush, who gave them to his son, Nimrod. And as soon as Nimrod put them on, he became a mighty hunter before God. We discuss this. How could it be? Oh, wait, where was this? This was in the Noah, Parsha Noah. I think that we discussed this particular part. Um, right. How could this guy, this, this terrible, terrible guy, who his name literally means we will rebel against God, 
How could he be a mighty hunter before God? He was basically cheating. Since the garments controlled nature around him, meaning all the animals submitted to him. So he's like, all right, today I want to get a tiger. Watch this, everybody. Hey, tiger, come here. And so on and so forth. But on the day of the death of Abraham, Esau killed Nimrod and stole the garments and hid them in his father's tent. That's when he sold his birthright to Jacob. In fact, they were sitting Shiva right then. That's why we know that the lentil stew, lentils is a sign of uh, avelut, if you're mourning the deceased. And why, by the way, we also discussed this, that Abraham, God took 15 years away from Abraham's life, so he would not have to see the kind of man that Esau would become. Anyway, but he died perfect. Okay, so the rest is history. <clears throat> Genesis 27, And his father Isaac said to him, Please come closer and kiss me, my son. Right? Here's where the sneaky exchange happened, only he wasn't. And he came closer and he kissed him and he smelled, Isaac smelled, the fragrance of his garments, which were not Asaph's garments, and he blessed him and he said, Behold, the fragrance of my son is like the fra fragrance of, this, of a field which the Lord has blessed. Okay? There's only one field that God is blessed like that. Garden of Eden. Okay? Now, how would Isaac know of this blessed field? Genesis 24, when he met his wife, and Isaac went forth to pray in the field towards evening, and he lifted his eyes, and he saw, behold, camels were approaching. And uh, where was Persia was that? This was in Chaye uh, Sarah, Silent Hero, I think. Uh, not so, yeah. He was in that same field. This is the same field of Machpelah, which surrounds the cave of Machpelah. Again, Isaac has buried his mother. Heartbroken. I mean, it was three years before, but he probably came to visit her gravesite. Okay? And he saw, and it was right over there. This is the gateway. To heaven so when Adam buried Eve we're getting back to it now and he smelled the fragrance which he once knew as being a former resident of course he began to dig and he kept on digging and digging and then it said yatsa bat kol because he was trying to get back to that place obviously who wouldn't bat kol mina shamayim okay until a voice from heaven said dayecha stop enough at that moment Adam stopped digging and passed from this world. And he was buried right there beside his wife. Who buried him? It was his son, Seth, who it says was in his likeness and image. He looked identical to Adam. And so when Abraham entered the cave, he knew exactly where he was. Now, Abraham knows the significance of this place. Do you think he's just gonna advertise it? Hey, guys, I, I think I found the entrance to Gan Eden. Everyone, all the inhabitants of the land, right? No. You think he's gonna show desperation in attaining it? I mean, he wants it really bad, but it's for, for reasons. He waited this whole time until Sarah, Sarah passed. I wanna bury my dead. This is where she died. I need to bury her right here. It's tradition. If anyone else knew of its significance, they would claim it for themselves. So now, back to our point. But only to the place which the Lord your God shall choose from all your tribes to set his name there. You shall inquire after his dwelling and come there. Why is this place alluded to so many times but not mentioned by name? We're talking about Jerusalem now. Again, the area of Jerusalem was indeed known, but the children of Israel did not know that that was the specific place. Then do we know why God did not say it outright? And don't worry, we'll get to that part as well. But do we know when Jerusalem became known as the place where the Lord chose to place his name? This goes back again to Abraham. And here's the connection between the Machpelah and Jerusalem, between Abraham and David over here with Moses right there in the middle. When Abraham originally wanted to purchase the field, the cave being inside the field, they, meaning the Jebusites, they didn't want to go through the transaction. There are many different things, uh, um, uh, accounts, you could even read it in the book of Jasher, they gave him a hard time. 
We could read the verses also in the Torah, how they didn't want to take anything from Abraham because they knew that the creator of the universe favored him. So they wanted something more than just money, which is, you know, why they were prepared to give it to him for free. No, no, man, you're a man of God. You are a prince, they called him. Take, take it, it's yours. But Abraham wanted to purchase it fair and square with documents and witnesses, which he did. So there will be no disputes in the future as to who has this land. Not that it matters because fools still try to dispute it. So the only way they agree to sell this is if Abraham, the man of God, would make a covenant with them. This goes back from Avimelech as well, who is also a Jebusite. Now, as we know, who famously inherited both Hebron and Jerusalem of the tribes? It was Judah, okay? The area of Temple Mount is um, cut right in the middle. Half is Benjamin and half is Judah. But Jerusalem and Hebron, this is all Judah. But still, it's all Judah. Yeah, okay. So, what was the covenant that was made with Abraham? It was the covenant that their city would not be conquered by Abraham's descendants. In other words, we know that God favors you. If you and I, we got a pact, no one's going to mess with us. So that's what happened. Abraham agreed. They swore to each other and a bargain was made. But what was their city? Where does it say? Let's find out, shall we? The book of Joshua, 1563. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. It says right here, Jerusalem. The children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwelt with the children of Judah in Jerusalem to this day. So there's your answer. And why could Judah not drive them out? Because the name of their forefather surround the forefathers rather surrounded the city. This will go up until the day of David, King David. There was a back and forth between the Judeans and the Jebusites. In order to maintain and ensure the oath, the Jebusites made copper images and placed them around Jerusalem, upon which were engraved the accord with Abraham. It was written on it along with the names of Isaac and Jacob, all around over there. We'll get to those details soon. Now, when King David tried to conquer Jerusalem, he could also not succeed until the markers, these markers, were removed. And so it said in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verses one and uh, we're going to just start reading from one. And all the tribes of Israel came to David to Hebron, because he knew the significance, and spoke, saying, Here we are, we are your bone and your flesh. Also, in times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led Israel out and brought them in. And the Lord said to you, You shall shepherd my nation, Israel, and you shall be a ruler over Israel. Just listen, just this is for you guys, okay? And all the elders of Israel, verse 3. And all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron. And King David enacted a covenant for them in Hebron before the Lord. And they anointed David as king over Israel. Okay? Now, third. Verse 4, 30 years old was David when he became king, and 40 years did he reign. Now, who would have thought that a king would not only need to be anointed by God, but by Israel and then accepted publicly for it to be so? Who would have thought such a crazy thing? I thought God said, there's my anointed and that's it. David was anointed when he was a kid, but only when he was 30 did he become king. Right? That's because this is how God works, where everything else is pagan. In Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem, he reigned 33 years over all of Israel and Judah. So it's 40 and a half years in total. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem, to the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, You shall not come here unless you remove the blind and the lame. It's not the blind and the lame. It says, Ha'ivrim v'apischim. What are these? And David said, You shall not, uh, and if so, say, David shall not come here. So, what are these ivrim and these pischim which needed to be removed? Rashi says the Jebusites were the seed of Avimelech, right? Remember back in the day with Abraham and with Isaac? Same guy. 
These two images were made in, with the names of Isaac and Jacob, and on them was the oath of Abraham. And that is why they were not permitted to capture Jerusalem by God. They could have. They were stronger. <coughs> but God did not give anyone permission to do it until God's anointed King David came along, which is when it was then known that we need to get Jerusalem. That's the place. David understood this. He removed the markers and easily took the city. God was keeping it uh, warm for them in the meantime. But now, why would David want Jerusalem? Did he know it was the spot? He did. He knew it was the spot. At some point, God shows him the spot, but there's something I just learned today from my beloved wife. Anyway, she's the expert in Jerusalem, okay? I'm just learning from her. First of all, Moses knew. Joshua knew. Uh, who else knew? Samuel knew. David learned with Samuel, so he knew it was a spot. That's why he took Goliath's head and marched into Jerusalem, not into Hebron. Because a pact, a treaty was broken over there. Anyway, 1 Chronicles 21. This is when it becomes official. This is very exciting. Because this is where it is. Okay. This is right after David took his own census of Israel. He sinned right here, which is something that only God is supposed to do, since they are God's people and not David's people. So, 1 Chronicles 21, we'll start with verse 7. You could read before that. Now, God was displeased because of this thing, and he smote Israel. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly in that I have done this thing, and now please put aside the iniquity of your servant, for I was very foolish. And the Lord spoke to Gad, Gad is the prophet, David's seer, is called Gad the seer, saying, go and speak to David, saying, so said the Lord, three things I offer you, choose one of them and I shall do it. And Gad came to David and said to him, so said the Lord, choose which you will, either three years famine or three months in which you will be destroyed by your enemies and the sword of your enemies will overtake you, or three days of the sword of the Lord and pestilence in the land, and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout the boundary of Israel. And now consider what I should reply to him who sent me. Wow. And David said to Gad, I am greatly oppressed. Let me fall now into the hand of uh, of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but into the hand of men let me not fall. And it's funny because every day when we say Tachanun, Tachanun is after Shmonesa, we pray to God about how we sinned. We confess, we, it's, confe it's called confession. We uh, vidui, we confess our sins, we beat our breasts, Ashamnu Bagadu, and so on and so forth. And it starts with this verse Vayomer David el Gad, Tsarli Meod, Epelana Beyad Hashem, Kirabim Rachamav Meod, and so on. So the Lord, verse 14, so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel and there fell from Israel 70,000 men. And God, God, sent an angel to Jerusalem, uh, to destroy it. And he destroyed and the Lord saw and regretted the evil. And he said to the destroying angel, it is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing, listen, by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between the earth and the sky. He was in, he was in the air, big dude, standing between the earth and the sky with a drawn sword in his hand, extended over Jerusalem, and David and the elder, elders covered with sackcloth and fell upon their faces. He, could you imagine seeing this sight? And David said to God, Did I not say to count the people? <clears throat> then I am the one who has sinned, and I have committed evil. But these sheep, what have they done? O Lord my God, I beg that your hand be against me and against my father's house, but not against your people for a plague. And the angel of the Lord said to Gad, the seer, to say to David that David should go up to erect an altar to the Lord 
in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. And David went up according to the word of Gad that he spoke in the name of the Lord. And Ornan returned and saw the angel. And his four sons who were with him hid themselves. And Ornan was threshing wheat. And David came upon Ornan. And Ornan looked and saw David. And he went forth from the threshing floor. And he bowed down to David with his face to the ground. And David said to Ornan, Give me the place of the threshing floor, so that I may so that I may build thereon an altar to the Lord. Give it to me for the full price, just like Abraham, so that the plague be stayed from the people. And Ornan said to David, Take for yourself, and may the Lord, the king, say, Here, take it for free. See, I have given the cattle, burnt offerings, and so on and so forth. And King David said to Ornan, No, for I will buy it for the full price. Who has Jerusalem now? See what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, for the Lord and offer up burnt offerings uh, for nothing. And David gave Ornan for the place shekels of gold weighing 600. And David built an altar to the Lord and he offered up burnt offerings, peace offerings. And he called out to the Lord and he answered him with fire from heaven on the altar of the burnt, burnt offerings. And the Lord commanded the angel and he returned his sword to his sheath. <clears throat> At that time when David saw that the Lord had answered him in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. Where is that? It's right up there. Temple Mount, right where the altar is and still should be. And the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses made in the desert and the altar of the burnt offerings at that time were in a high place in Gibeon. And then they moved it there. But David could not go before to inquire of God because he was frightened by the sword of the angel of the Lord. Basically, you have this gigantic angel of the Lord with his sword downward, coming down on Jerusalem, God said, stop. And it stopped right there. And the sword was over Jerusalem. And the tip of the sword was pointing exactly on the spot. Boom. That's how David saw. And, and then he said, this is where the altar is going to be. This is where the Mishkan is going to be. This is where the temple is going to be. What a clear sign. And David was the one who got it. Behold, Temple Mount. The real Halatzion and the Holy of Holies and the Mishkan. It's beautiful. <clears throat> From that moment on, Har Habayit, Temple Mount, became what it is. And until this very day, Jerusalem is and always has been the most coveted piece of real estate in the world. The city that was built and destroyed over 35 times. The city that Christianity and Islam are claiming for themselves as ridiculous as that may sound. So, do we know why Moses did not reveal the location of God's chosen spot? And again, just so we're very clear, Moses absolutely knew where the spot was. We've been reading it. We've been studying it. God showed it to him as well as the very end of days and every leader of Israel leading up to that point until the coming of Mashiach ben David. As Moses was taken through time to see all the things that he could eventually rest, knowing that he will be back to finish what he began in the end of days. This time, my friends, is almost upon us. But this place was not shared with the children of Israel, so there should not be any quarreling among the tribes as to who gets the land. It was not shared until David, so the nations would not ferociously fortify cities and armies around Jerusalem up until that point. Although they tried for thousands of years since, but they've all tried, right? Although the Christians, Edom, Esav, have temporarily captured Jerusalem and put up their whatever's all over the place, they could not hold on to it because, behold, Islam, Ishmael, would take it from them, and then back and forth and back and forth. And this is how it would go. But the land of Israel, Jerusalem in particular, would never flourish under the hands of pagans. These are facts. Why do you think God allowed his land to be defiled and raped by mosques popping up where our holy sites are, in places that have nothing to do with Islam? Or churches on every other corner here in Jerusalem is disgusting, and gates with signs property of the Roman Catholic Church in Jerusalem. Not only in Jerusalem, but elsewhere. What? 
Ah, the land shall be emptied and it shall be pillaged, for the Lord has spoken this thing. Isaiah 24. Pillaged, I say. Pillaged, says the Lord. This happens so they can come in and do this. And all these abominations that remain, though, they serve a purpose. Prophecies must be fulfilled, right? <clears throat> all foreign traces will absolutely be wiped out from the golden dome above Temple Mount to all the crucifixes and churches all over Israel to the Supreme Court building in Jerusalem. Yeah, that's right. It's got the all-seeing eye with the pyramid on top of it. That ain't holy. That's satanic. It's here. You could see it when you're driving by. It's unbelievable. And like everything else, that too will fall. And the Lord shall become king over all of the earth. On that day shall the Lord be one in his name one. The whole earth shall be changed to be like a plain. Everything's going to come down from the hill of Rimon to the south of Jerusalem. But it, Jerusalem, will be elevated high and remain in its old place from the gate of Benjamin to the place of the first gate until the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel until the king's wine cellars. And they shall dwell therein and there shall be no more destruction, but Jerusalem shall dwell in safety. Zechariah 14. God knew very well what the world would look like, obviously. That they would want to claim the Torah, Jerusalem, Israel, all the holy sites for their own. So you got the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Arabs, the uh, Crusaders, the Mamluks, the Turks, the Brits. Oh, and now it's the UN and the uh, NWO. All laid claim and are laying, uh, laying claim to Israel and to Jerusalem. No, no, no. You can never have Jerusalem. It's already been claimed. It's already been reserved. It has been given. It has a name stamped on it. You see, if you actually pay attention to everything that is said throughout the Tanakh, with the right perspective, of course, you will most likely not go astray or be deceived. The problem is that, unfortunately, Many see the New Testament as either something new or the extension of, and that's why there's so much confusion. Have you not been paying attention? Do you see? God purposely placed the Torah for all the world to get their hands on it. Sure, go ahead. Take it, translate it, change the wording. Have at it, boys. He also left his land desolate. Go ahead, try to inhabit it. Go ahead, try to build an empire here. Go ahead, try. Have at it. But only Israel can unlock the secrets of the Torah and only Israel can live prosperously in the Holy Land with the Holy City. Don't you understand? When we build that temple, what it's going to do to the world? The world will be elevated. No one seems to understand this. Like, we would rather die than give the Jews the power to do anything. You're not giving us anything. Don't worry about it. Because if what is written is not enough, then just look at your history. How about archaeology? Look at what is being dug up. This is undeniable. You don't want to see. Our people have a Tanakh in one hand and a shovel in the other hand. And they're like, ah, oh, yes. And yet... Everyone's got problems with what is being brought up. And one more thing. Do you think it's any coincidence? Now we're going back to the beginning about serving other gods. Do you think it's any coincidence that in this same Parsha that alludes over and over to God's secrets and to the secret of the connectivity between heaven and earth, his desired location, his truth, that he speaks of the false prophet? and how you will be led astray. Chapter 13, verse one. Everything I command you, that you shall be careful to do. Be careful. You shall neither add to it, nor subtract from it. Did you hear that? You know, like part twos and whatnots. 
If there will arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, a dreamer of a dream, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, which just about all our sages knew how to do up until this very day, okay? The Baba Sali was turning water into wine before people said, okay, great, wonderful. No, you're not a god, you're a man who understands the secrets. Good for you. And the sign of the wonder of which he spoke to you happens, and he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known, and let us worship them. What, it, what is to go astray is to not follow God's exact commandments, right? We just read that in black and white earlier. So, you know, like going astray, like starting a new religion or undoing the law or turning, uh, you know, God into a man and stuff like that. You shall not heed the words of that prophet or that dreamer of a dream for the Lord your God. <clears throat> How else can I say this? Oh, I'll read the text. Is testing you. Ah, is testing you, is testing you. If anything goes against the Torah, there's a test to know whether you really love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall follow the Lord your God, fear him, keep his commandments, heed his voice, worship him. You worship God. Nothing else. You don't worship the Torah. The Torah is a tool that is used to help you worship God. You don't worship the Torah. Mm. And cleave to him. Because if you follow God, you won't be fooled. You won't be deceived. And that prophet of that dream of a dream shall be put to death because he spoke falsehood about the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt by himself, I myself, Anochi and who redeemed you from the house of bondage by himself to lead you astray from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to go, so shall you clear away the evil from your midst, from your midst, and from your midst. And make no mistake, oh, there is evil in our midst. Not prophets, but prophet. And you are being tested and you are failing because you cannot be in idolatry and serve God, because you still carry in your heart that which you could not let go, that's what, that which you would not let go. And that's why the world looks today the way it does. And all the mitzvot that you do or think that you do will count for nothing as long as your heart serves another, worships another, places another before God instead of God, on the side of God. You cannot pick and choose which commandments suit you or which you agree or disagree with. Do not follow signs or wonders, says the Lord. Like I said, our sages could perform signs and wonders. They could do incredible things, but no one cares. No one, great, they can do this because they understand Torah. No one follows them and calls them God. If you follow God, you too can do signs and wonders. Got news for you. Open your eyes so you can see the unseen. And so I'll let you in on a little secret, but shh, don't tell anyone, okay? The connection between Hebron, where the Machpelah is, and Jerusalem. See, the name Hebron comes from the word Hever, Haver, friend, Hever, Lechaber, to connect. It's a connection. See, there's an underground passageway between Hebron and Jerusalem and Temple Mount. One gate leads to another gate. Okay. But no one dare go there. Truth is, you can't. It's closed. But it will be open again, once again, when Mashiach comes and the patriarchs and the matriarchs, Adam and Eve, will rise from the dead and make their way through Derech, Chevron. This is called the Way of Chevron. It's also a street right here. It's a beeline from Chevron directly to Temple Mount. Okay? <clears throat> no one teaches you this stuff because they have no clue. And the reason that I'm sharing this with you now is because there's no stopping what's coming. The gates of heaven, indeed. So I know this was a lot, but it all had to be said. Thanks for sticking around. 
have a wonderful rest of the week. You know, always remember to be a man and not a sheep. Stay awake and don't you dare go to sleep. Ask the right questions and you will always get your answer because if you hold it inside, it'll eat you like cancer. You must know this, my friends, that God does not condemn questions, but he condones. So stay safe out there. Believe nothing they tell you and have a Shabbat Shalom.